All right. Um, well, um, I will welcome everybody here. Thank you for, for joining us. And we are um, joined by Nick Chancellor, who is one of the co-developers of the um, Saving Schrodinger's Cat game in the Physics Quest 2021 kit. Um, and we're excited to have him here today to talk you through the activity and answer any questions you have um, about implementing it with your with your students. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to Nick and um, yeah, take it away. Okay, well, um, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Ali. Thanks for having me. And um, I'm excited to talk about this. Um, this has actually been a really sort of exciting development. Um, and as I'll talk about in my talk, I'll talk about a bit of the history of this. The card game, as you've probably seen, actually came out of a video game that my grad student developed. Um, and that's Laura Nita, um, who's really been sort of the, I would say, the lead on this. It's, um, I would say, a student-led project, um, a postgraduate student. Um, and then we've also collaborated with people in education. So I'm in the physics department here at Durham University, but I've also worked with Helen and Laura from the education department here. Um, I am in the United Kingdom. I'm in the north of England. It's two in the afternoon right here, roughly. Um, and um, Laura runs a company that produces a video game that's related to this. We didn't do the activity as a video game for reasons I'll explain later. Um, but for the purposes of this, I think having having the video game here is is helpful and having licenses available, you know, just gives you something more you can try out. Um, so first, what are we doing with this? Well, what we're really doing here, um, and just to say real quick, if anyone has questions, do feel free to interrupt. If you have a question, probably everyone else does too. And so don't feel like you have to wait till the end. If you if I'm not clear about something or you wanna know about how something works or wanna hear more about something, just feel free to interrupt and, um, and ask and I'll, uh, I'll try to answer. Um, I can't really see the chat, so just, just unmute. I will, again. Nick, I'll, I'll monitor the chat. So if people put okay, questions cool. there, Thanks. then I can help voice cool. them. Thanks. Okay, cool. Well then do feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so why have we done this? Well, the usual way of doing quantum mechanics or the, yeah, of doing matrix algebra can definitely be a bit intimidating. And there's also stereotypes around it about sort of which groups of people should and shouldn't be good at math, as people say. So, and some people just think better visually than they do with equations and having something for those people or traditional equations, having something for those people is good and it can just add some gamification to it. So originally we made this video game Quantum Odyssey, which licenses have, have been provided as part of this. Um, we also adapted it to a card game, which is what I'll mostly talk about here. Um, but with, yeah. Um, so as part of the Physics Quest project, um, which is why we're here, um, we wanted to do something with this game we developed. And we've been talking to, to APS about it. We we're all very excited. but doing a video game wouldn't have worked very well. Not all classrooms would have had computers available. Um, there's different software and operating systems. And these barriers would have kind of elected the schools that are better resourced. And we really didn't want that. We kind of wanted this to be available for everyone and maybe even more so to the people who are, you know, having more difficulty, say, financially and with, with other other things. So to avoid this, what we did is we made a card game. And the idea is then you can just ship out the card game. All you really need is a way to cut the pieces out and, you know, and, and you're good to go. Um, and so this is available from Physics Quest. It was also sent in the email prior to this uh, workshop. Um, so let's actually get into this. And to get into what the game's based on, I have to do a little bit of a refresher on the basic idea of quantum mechanics and specifically what makes it different to the classical mechanics we're used to experiencing every day. 
So classically, we have probabilities and they can only add, they can never subtract. So thinking about an example, if we consider, I'm thinking about what's the probability my shoes are wet when I get home at the end of the day. Well, if we only consider the fact that I could have gotten rained on, then there's, there's some probability that will basically relate to how likely is it to rain that day, which in the part of the world I live, it's fairly high, but might be different in different parts of the world. Um, if you then say, well, actually, that's not really the only way your feet could have gotten wet. It could have been a sunny day, but there could also be sprinklers that happen to go off while you're walking by them on the way home. Now, with classical, in the classical world, you can kind of see this can never make it less likely that your, your shoes are wet in this example. This can never, de adding a new way something can happen can never decrease the likelihood it happened. It can only increase it or do nothing in the case where say the sprinklers only go off when it's raining for some reason, which would be weird. But if that happened, but it can never decrease it. Um, in quantum mechanics, you have what are called probability amplitudes. I'll do talk a little bit about a simple real world example. I'll sort of phrase it in the language of the game, which is of cats based on the sort of Schrodinger cat example. Um, and this is what's called the Hong Lu Mandel effect. Um, and the point is quantum mechanically adding a new way something can happen can decrease the likelihood it can happen or make it so it doesn't happen at all. So this Hong Lu Mandel effect is a real physical effect you can do with photons and you actually can have one outcome, the likelihood of it happening reduces exactly to zero because there's more than one way it can happen. And that's visualized very nicely in our game. Um, in this case, since it involves a slightly bigger system, it's not directly visualized in the card game, but a similar effect can be. Um, and the important thing is this ability to add and subtract means you have to have another property in quantum mechanics. There's a property known as phase. And the combination of phases determines whether these amplitudes, like probabilities, whether they add or whether they subtract. Um, is determined by this. So this is a new concept which um, we use to represent the quantum system. Now let's talk about how we do that. Well, we need three ingredients. Um, we need a representation of the amplitudes. So whether there's a likelihood to be in a state or not. Um, and this needs to include phase information. This needs to include information about are they going to add? Are they going to subtract? Are they going to sort of do something somewhat in between? Um, we need a sort of list of how likely it's going to be in each of these to describe them. And we'll represent these by game tokens in the game, by these cat tokens that I'll talk about later. Um, we need operations, something to actually happen for it to be interesting. Um, and this is represented by the cards in the game. Um, and we need rules. We need rules for, well, if we put these through the cards, what happens? What, in particular, what happens if two of these tokens collide and they're, you know, the same colors or different colors, we use the colors to represent phase. Um, and we do this visually with rules that we explain in the, in the game rules in the, in the physics quest packet. So let's go through these ingredients real quick. So in the first ingredient, the states. So here we're looking at a simple system. Because we're doing things with cards, we don't want it to be too complicated. We don't want things getting too big. So we just consider one system that has two possibilities. So a cat, it's either asleep or awake. We wanted to use this rather than alive or dead because it's, it's with kids. Um, so um, we can have tokens on the left side or the right side to correspond to asleep or awake. And we put these tokens to represent which the cat is. Um, because it's quantum mechanical, you have a superposition. Um, this is where there's some likelihood of being asleep, some likelihood of being awake. Um, and we have four colors of tokens, um, or four. And we also allow some pairs of those colors to represent eight different what are called phases, which determine whether or not they interfere or 
um, whether or not they add or whether they uh, subtract. Um, and mathematically, this set of state is known as state vectors, but we're not really going to go into the details of that. Um, so um, the second ingredient that we need here and that we have are these quantum operations, these gates. So here we have different things that can happen to our cat token. So here we have a cat that starts being awake. This red line just changes the phase. It changes the color. That does nothing unless it runs into another cat token. And this is an important property of quantum mechanics is that this phase actually only determines how things interfere. It only determines what happens when things run into each other. A red token on awake and a blue token on awake mean that the cat is definitely awake and don't actually mean anything different. And then you see here, basically, you just follow these paths on the cards. Um, you can join and split paths. Um, and that's what this H gate token is. Um, H is a Hadamard gate. It's a, a gate from quantum computing. You don't really need to know that detail to play the game. But we have just used the notation because it's easier to keep track of what's what. So that's what these Xs and Zs and Hs are. Um, you don't need to worry about that unless you want to. Um, but so yeah, then what do we do when we want to join and split these paths? Because here we have one cat going along, acquiring phases and going from sleep to awake, but the phase does nothing unless they run into each other. And being asleep or awake, you can just describe classically in the classical world. So ingredient three are interference rules. What happens if we have cat tokens of different colors and we combine them? And this isn't all the rules. There's a little bit on the bottom, but it looked nicer to truncate this. And you can see, as I said before, depending on the colors, sometimes you end up with two tokens. Sometimes you end up with no tokens. So these, for instance, red plus blue cases or green plus yellow cases are examples where you've completely, um, completely canceled. Um, the amplitude. And so this is the thing that doesn't make any sense in the classical world we're in, where having two different ways things can happen, but they combine in the right way means this never happened. Um, so this is a way that you can get a cat from being in a superposition of asleep and awake to being definitely asleep or definitely awake, is if one set cancels and one set doesn't and stays reinforces. Um, there are some technicalities about how the math under this works that we're not going to go into, something called normalization, making sure the probabilities add to one. But for the purposes of the game, you don't need to think about that. Um, so let's give an example of these rules. So a simple example, we start with a cat here. And here we have an edge that splits. So we just make two cat tokens and put them each on different paths. And then we go and say, all right, well, this splits again. And what happens here is now, well, this cat token will turn red because this line's red, so that changes the color. There's rules on how the colors change when it goes down these different, different lines. And here we have a red and a blue. We could look this up in the table and go, okay, that cancels out. And here we have a blue and a blue. And we can look that up in the table and go, okay, that turns into a single single blue cat token. And we see that we end up where we started with. We started with a cat that was asleep. We went to a set where it might be asleep, might be awake, and went back to being asleep. Um, so there's you can combine these in more and more complicated ways. But we've worked it out so that all the possibilities that you can make with these cards are covered by the rules we've written. Um, you won't, you can't run into a situation where you don't know what to do based on the rules we have because we've covered at least every possibility with these rules. There's more quantum states than you could have here, but we had to make this simple enough. And one of the ways we simplified is only allowing a certain set of states you're allowed. Um, so. What do we actually do with this? Rather than just have a, okay, well, you have these little tokens and edges you can do stuff with. What we've had is 
some puzzles. Um, and so the first puzzle is very simple. If we apply one of these X gates, which fortunately actually looks like an X the way it's drawn, that's not why it's named that, but it is a fortunate coincidence. Um, you can apply this to simply have a cat that's asleep and wake it up. Now this is completely classical. Um, the next puzzle is, well, how do we do this without using this card? The card that's this X card that just switches you. Can we do that? Can we use this one that creates a superposition with one that does something with the face? The answer, it turns out, is yes. Um, you can go, go through one of these, create half asleep, half awake, paint one red, and then they actually end up going to the other side. Um, you can play without play with this in the game and work this out um, after we're done, uh, done here. Um, then we have turning a superposition where they're in a combination of a sleep and awake into a single cat token. Um, thinking about what this means with the color. So I've kind of hinted at this already that it's only actually meaningful when they combine. It's not actually the color on its own doesn't actually affect anything. It doesn't affect where it goes. Um, this is the concept of the symmetry under global phase in quantum mechanics, if you're interested in the mathematics. If you're not, then you don't need to care about that. Um, and then we think about which gates can we make out of other gates? In other words, which cards can we make have the same effect as other cards? Um, so. For example, using the H and the Z card, you can actually make something that behaves exactly the same as the X card. You could actually do the same thing with an H and an X card. You can make something that behaves exactly like a Z card. Um, and so thinking about that. And then the final bit is just, well, now you have all these cards and hopefully understand the rules. Uh, we challenge them to make their own puzzles and to say, can you stump your friends? Can you say, you know, here's, here's the challenge I want you to go from this to this using only these, can you do it? Um, and you know, it gives them a bit of a bit of an exercise um, there to think about the next level up. Think about not only how can you solve challenges with this, but how, how can you punch this with this? Um, so that's sort of the idea of the card game. Um, maybe before we go on, does anyone have any questions? Um, it's all right if no one's looked at this already, but has anyone sort of looked at this or had any questions or just from what I'm saying, have any questions? No? Is there anything in the chat? Um, I am looking now, but pe uh, people should feel free to, to drop something in the chat. Um, and I okay. will voice it. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, this just seemed like a natural spot to to ask pause. before I switch gears and uh, talk about um, some of the uh, the other stuff that goes a little bit beyond um, the the card game uh, content. Um, if not, I'll just keep going ahead. Um, okay. So, as I mentioned before, this card game is based on a video game. Um, so in the video game, instead of just having two channels of a sleep or wake, we think of having more than one cat. Um, so we do this in quantum computing notation, where instead of a sleep and awake, we use one and zero, because that's what people use in computers. It turns out it doesn't really matter. You can think of it however you want. Um, if you prefer cats being asleep and awake, you can you know, substitute in your mind a picture of a sleeping cat and an awake cat for the one and the zero. Um, and the thing is though, now you get, every time you add a cat, you double the number of possibilities because each cat can be asleep or awake and they're independent of each other. So if there's one cat, there's two possibilities, two cats, there's four, three, there's eight, four, there's 16, et cetera, et cetera. Five, there's 32. We don't allow it to go beyond five because it gets too messy. Um, it's not a computer limitation, it's a human visualization limitation. Um, and instead of drawing things like cats, we have balls. Um, 
just because we weren't really going with the cat theme. Again, you can imagine them as cats if you like. Um, and we also have them being different sizes, representing how likely they are to be on the different routes. Because the video game has more flexibility, they don't actually have to all be the same size the way they are in the card game. But you can reproduce everything in the card game in the video game, just not, not the opposite direction. Um, so this is available at my student's company, but it's been avail made available for free to all of you um, to try out if you like, um, or you can stick to the card game. It's really up to you. Um, so I'll now- just, Nick, can I just mention something yeah. real quick here? Um, the email you all received from me yesterday um, has the access key code. So you can mm -hmm. um, use the Quantum Odyssey game for, um, for free. So just yep. uh, check that email. And if you can't find it, you can always uh, reach back out to me and I'll send you um, send you that again. Yep. And part of why we did this with the game is just that doing things online, we thought it would be easier to screen share the game rather than to try to describe what you're doing on, with cards on a table. Of course, if people prefer to point their webcam at cards on a table, they're, they're welcome to. Um, so, Let's now real quick talk about a real world example of this and one that we've actually we've written up in a paper on this and that involves a little more than you can do in the card game, but is something you can actually really have in the real world and think about it with the cats. Um, so this is an effect known as the Hongu Mandel effect, um, where if you have two identical photons, so particles of light, the inner a beam splitter. Um, so there's four possibilities now based on which, which path the photon goes in. You can have one on each channel. Um, you can have both on one, both on the other. Um, well, so, so yeah, yeah. Um, and you, if you think of them as distinguishable, you can have them in either order. Um, so um, two, so yeah, so the way we think of this is two identical photons in our beam splitter. Now, rather than asleep and awake, where they are traveling vertically or horizontally, um, there's four paths, either neither reflect two different ways for only one to reflect, because it's two particles, or they both reflect. Um, so what happens quantum mechanically if you do this, so you send them in in two different directions, they'll both come out in the same direction. So you're thinking of it here, horizontal and vertical, They'll both either come out both horizontal or both vertical. They'll never come out one horizontal and one vertical. This is different than what you have classically. Uh, classically, you can imagine if you drop a ball on, say, something that bounces it like a Plinko board, you can easily have them both go either direction both go or both go the same direction. And if you assume they're acting independently and it's sort of a fair distribution, you actually have a 50% chance one bounces each direction, but this never happens in the quantum case. Um, so we can visualize this with the game. Um, so in this case, um, the photon travels, um, direction of travel is represented by the one or zero, like I said. You can think of this as cats, asleep or awake, start in a positive superposition. So this just relates to how they would cancel. If you started in a negative one, you'd end up with something different but there's some technical reasons in the physics why that's what you don't start with. So in this case, this is one cat awake, one asleep, but you don't know which it is. And the phase is positive between them, which doesn't really have a classical analog because there isn't phase in the classical world. Um, and the beam splitters are represented by this H gate, this Hadamard gate. Um, and here you can see if we say one is going horizontal, uh, one, uh, and zero is vertical, or one is awake, zero is asleep. You start off with one's asleep, one's awake, and you don't know which, and you end up with either they're both awake or they're both asleep, because you can see the cases where one's awake and one's asleep cancel. You can substitute this for photons of light, and everything just goes through the way it normally does. Um, one slight technicality here is to notice that Technically, quantum optics, they paint the edges a little different colors than we do. Um, we've just done that to make this similar to what people do in quantum computing. It's a very technical point. Um, 
And the cool thing here is this is a real physical effect that you can see in a lab. And um, it's an experiment that's now relatively straightforward to reproduce, at least in these advanced physics labs. But we've represented it without any map. We've just drawn this picture and had some balls and followed some simple rules. Um, you could argue that is math, and I would argue it is, but no traditional math. You don't have any equations. Um, and so this allows you to visualize the quantum mechanics without having a lot of equations that many students might find scary, intimidating, or just not like. Um, so we've done research on this approach. We would like to do more, but we've, we've started to look at this. Um, and we, we have a paper studying Again, the game, the video game version, not the card game version, just because it was a bit more flexible and we um, had some laptops to be able to do the trial. And some of the key results, one of the big results we found was that what was really the deciding factor on whether students did well with this approach was how interested they were in puzzle games. Um, there wasn't a statistically significant effect from gender, previous quantum mechanics knowledge, or interest in quantum computing. We were particularly worried that because video games tend to be marketed more toward young men and boys that there might be a gender effect there and that um, we, we might see this approach appealing more to the, the male participants, but that actually wasn't what happened. Um, the only real significant deciding factor was, do they like puzzle games? Um, and the other thing we found, because not only did we take numbers, and you see here we've, we've got some counts, basically these colors correspond to how interested they are in puzzle games, with black being very interested and the lighter purple being not very interested. You see the more interested ones got much, much further to the point where the only one who completed all of them was answered the highest score on being interested. Um, but we also ask them questions. And one thing we consistently found is they wanted to understand what was going on underneath this. They didn't want to just play. They really liked the, okay, what does this mean? Which we thought was a very positive sign um, for, for this approach um, in that it seems to actually help want them to learn, not just okay, this is sort of a fun game, but I'm just gonna treat it like Candy Crush or something and not really care about what it's representing underneath, at least the, the participants in our trial, um, who were a variety of different ages, some of whom were school ages, some of which were older, some were people in industry, um, but generally across all of them, they wanted to understand what was going on behind it. Um, and so now on to the, perhaps more exciting part of this workshop. Well, after we can maybe have some questions if anyone else has, um, let's give this a try. Um, so as I said before, oh, sorry, Ali, did you wanna come in there? Yeah, I think before um, before we go into giving it a try, um, I did have a question come in through oh, the absolutely. chat. From um, from from Sue and and Sue has said that um, that that she has played the games um, with her her student and it worked out well. Um, the student didn't come in with any you know prior understanding of what quantum meant, and so they approach it by discussing the difference between classical world and quantum world. Um, whereas they they talked about quantum being really really small, um, and Sue is wondering um, if there was maybe a better or a different way to be presenting presenting the game and the framing of the game to the student or um you know do you, is that the best uh the best approach to really discuss the the difference between classical and quantum as quantum is talking about really really small things so i think saying that it's talking about really really small things is good um and it's it typically is there are some examples where it can describe larger things but for the most part i think saying it's describing things that are really really small is is right i i think that is a good way to do it um the difference i tend to highlight is not only does this 
the reason you don't see these effects is because typically it's it's on very very small systems it can happen in large ones but only very very special large ones nothing that's like in the conditions you'd have in in your room they have to be you know very very cold for instance you can actually have large systems that are very very cold will have these effects um but yeah so so i think that's a good explanation for why this isn't something you see in real life um you can actually see some of these effects in real life um using um polarization gratings um uh but that's probably not quite worth going into but light actually does you can actually see some of the quantum effects of that day to day but it's subtle um the thing i go for for what makes it different in terms of what you can observe is what i said before is that the likelihood that things can happen you don't just have probabilities that can only add things can cancel out and I mean, there's a whole field of foundations of quantum mechanics, which is arguing why it's different from classical mechanics. Um, so, you know, people have people write whole long papers on this, but um, I think that's a fairly simple way to explain sort of how it's different and why you don't see it every day. I think it's very good to say, yeah, it's usually very small things or very, um, very, uh, very cold, very, very different from what you usually see. But then how is it different? I would say is that you can have different sort of paths, different different ways can either add up or cancel. Um, one way to think about why it has to be different um, is you can actually think about where the word quantum comes from. So quantum means discrete. It means you have things that are on like discrete energy levels. And so everything kind of has to be fuzzy because otherwise things would have to exactly match for energy to be conserved and basically nothing would happen. Um, and so you kind of need this to, if the smallest fundamental part of nature is discrete, you kind of need this fuzziness to sort of lubricate it so things happen. Otherwise nothing would happen because you'd have two atoms where the energies don't exactly match and oops, nothing could happen because energy wouldn't be conserved. And quantum mechanics gives you a get out. Um, and you don't have to worry about that in big, large systems. Um, and those effects tend to cancel out and you don't see, you know, you, you, you don't go into your kitchen and see a quantum superposition. You don't actually see a cat that's in the superposition of asleep and awake um, in, in the real world. Um, um, but yeah, did that, um, hopefully that answered uh, answered the question. If not, I'm, I'm happy for a follow-up. Um, thank you, it looks like, yeah, looks like that 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 helped. Um, uh, so thank you for that, that was that was useful. Okay, um, yeah, no no problem. Does, um, does anyone want to know anything else or to, to ask anything else before we uh, move on? No, okay. Um, well, do do feel free to write things in chat or or just interrupt if um if you do have uh have things um other things you you think of during this. Um, so what we're going to do today is we thought giving the video game licenses would be nicer because if you're doing things remotely over screens, we thought it would be easier to screen share. Hopefully, this will work well with the Zoom screen share. I think it will. Um, but um, the idea here is we can sort of circulate, answer questions, help people out. Um, one thing on the next slide, I'll give some suggestions you can do, but these are only suggestions. Um, I don't really want to be too prescriptive of saying, I think you should do this, this, and this. Um, I think it's much better to be able to sort of have fun and explore this and then I can answer questions or you know other people um what you know what will be circulating around to answer questions and to give some assistance um and um yeah 
but it is probably worth giving some suggestions just so you don't sort of feel stuck. So what I would recommend people might want to do is first off, um, since we have the, the, the booklet from the game, um, try to reproduce some of the puzzles from the card game within the video game. Um, if you have the cards and tokens cut out, you can even follow along with a printed printed out version. You know, maybe you can have one person drive the game and sharing the screen and other people suggesting um, what to do. Um, and that could be kind of an interesting way to do it. And then you can see the sort of animated version versus the version you're doing by hand. Um, play around with um, what you can do with a single qubit or a single cat in the card game. Um, so qubit is quantum bit. It, it's a system that can be in one of two states, in this case, a cat that can be asleep or awake. Um, and here you can think, OK, can I understand the rules the video game follows based on the card game rules? You can get into a little more complicated situation with the video game because you can have balls of different sizes. You can have more types of states in the video game. But can you sort of understand how that comes from the card game rules? And then the other fun one is either with the card game or the video game, can you design puzzles to, to stump other people? Can you say, you know, okay, can, can you get the balls to this place or to another place? Or can you design ones that stump yourself? Can you do, how do I prepare this? Um, there are some things that maybe you actually can't do. Um, I think you can reach pretty much any state, but um, some will be harder than others. Um, and then the last thing that I'd recommend if people want is to just try some of the other video game content. There's a lot in there to sort of play with. Um, maybe it's better to sort of explore the things related to the card game first, since that's sort of the main point here. But I just want to point out that that's there in case people are interested. Um, so that's all I had for presentations. Um, probably would be good to open it up if there are any more questions. Um, I, I, I suggest, could you walk through like one of the examples of a card game on the video game before, so that people um, know how to go through it? Um. So um, I actually, the computer I currently have off is a Linux computer. I was trying to get my Windows machine um, up and running so that it could have, so that I could have the video game also logged in, um, but I didn't quite, didn't quite um, manage to get there. Um, I can explain it though with the picture of what the interface is, um, and hopefully that will be um, as good. So. With the video game, um, you can ignore this bit to the side. That's something you can turn on and off. It just shows the mathematics. Um, you probably don't need to worry about that. But basically, you have these drag and drop menus. Um, sometimes this menu is minimized in the corner. But if you go into the game and go into the menu and click sort of play or build example, um, you'll have something like this. If you go into the actual game content, it will start giving you instruction. But there's a sort of an option that allows you to sort of freely create the games. What you have here is very similar to the cards, at least for this part, is you can just take these and drag and drop them. So qubits, which are in our case cats, you can change the number there. The card game, there's only one. Um, and the game, the gate slots is how many cards you can put sequentially. Um, so then here you have all kinds of cards. Um, there's arrows to, to move through more. And basically what you do is you just click and drag and drop um, and drop there. Um, so I can show an example without it actually being animated. Um, so for example, if we did this second puzzle of going from asleep to awake um, without using the um, X gate, um, what I do here, is I'd say, and fortunately, uh, what I'd say is, okay, first off, I'd only want one of these qubits. Um, so I would click here and go down to only one. Um, click at the bottom where there's the 
Minus, can people see my um, my pointer? Yes. Um, I'm, yes, okay, cool. Um, that's helpful. So I, I'd click here to um, reduce the number of qubits. Um, if I wanted to um, then do this, what I do is I take one of these H's and drag it here where there actually already is one by coincidence. Um, and then I'd see that there, I've turned the um, the uh, single ball, the, the single cat that's asleep or ball that's in the zero to a superposition um, where they're both blue. If I add this Z in below that, so I take this and drag it there, um, then what will happen is the one on the right will turn red as it goes through there. Um, and then I put another one of these down below. And what happens there, and that'll all be animated here. You don't interact with this part. It just, it creates it for you. It, it creates the drawing for you. Um, what would happen here is that this would then, you'd have a red and a blue. You see this red channel on the uh, right side. If you have a red cat going through a red channel, it turns it back blue. Um, that's within the game rules. Um, and then you'd end up with, on the blue channels, it keeps its color. So you'd end up with what would happen is you'd have a red one going down here, a blue one going down here. So it would cancel on this side. On this side, you'd have two blue ones that would add. And so you'd end up with your cat going from asleep to awake. Um, and yeah, sorry, I don't have the animated version of that. I I think um, Nick, I might be able to share. I know on oh. I believe the um, the teacher guide we have a link to of like a video that kind of shows that. Um, um, that would me, be awesome. Yeah, let me let me pull let that me, up. Yeah, let me stop sharing so you can share that. Um, okay. That would um, that would be really would be yeah, a little might better be than helpful. Um, than me, me going through it in words. I can try to get my uh, Windows laptop. I had it up and ready to go, and then it wasn't plugged in. So this, it's... no problem. Let me. I think I found it. One second here, okay. and I'll share my screen. Okay. Sorry, wrong link. Let me grab the right one. Pulling it up now. Since the birth of human. Uh, not that one. Hold on one second. Sorry about this, guys. Let me find it. Okay, I think I found it. Um, yes, I did. So this will, I will share my screen and this will show you all um, kind of how the, the video game works. So let me share my screen. And this will at least give you examples of, um, of- Why is quantum computation counterintuitive? Well- the Can you all see that and hear that? Yeah, I, I can see it. Okay, so this will show you kind of how some of the things that Nick was talking about, and then we'll go practice it in the actual game. Let's imagine we have a simple coin, heads and tails. Each time we toss this coin, we get either heads or tails. If we throw it 100 times, we'd expect to get 50 tails and 50 heads. Now showing this process in Quantum Odyssey is trivial. Here's our coin before the toss. We have zero for tails and one for heads. We haven't yet added any instructions to this, so our coin isn't yet tossed. It ends up at zero 100% of the time, shown by the blue ball. Now let's imagine we've tossed the coin. We're encoding the act of tossing the coin in the puzzle by adding an HC gate right here. As you can see, from the moment I've placed it, our previous 100% zero outcome has become a 50-50 outcome. 50% on tails and 50% on heads. Let's try an interesting thing here. 
Let's flip the coin on the other side before we toss it, so it'll be heads up before the toss. To encode that instruction, I'll add an escape right here. It's exactly the same output. Regardless of whether I flip the coin before tossing it or not, the outcome is the same. In the real world, probabilistic acts like tossing a coin do not preserve information. What happened before a probabilistic event is forever lost to us. This, however, is not possible in the quantum world, where information is always preserved. Now this is a quantum coin toss. We encode the act of the quantum coin toss in the puzzle by adding an H gate, not HC like we previously did. Now flipping the coin with an X gate before the toss does have an effect in the quantum world. The act of tossing a quantum coin preserves information about the toss. You can see as the ball is turning its color to red. These are now two distinct events, tossing one quantum coin that was previously flipped versus a quantum coin that was not previously flipped. Now what do you expect will happen if we add another quantum probabilistic coin toss? Well, we recover the initial state of the coin, not what you had expected, huh? This goes to show how counterintuitive quantum intuition is relative to our normal life expectations. You can learn all about it and much more in Quantum Odyssey coming out this 8th of December. Join our live lunch. Um, so that gives just a, a, a preview into how we can build like the X gates and the H gates and things in the game. Um, so hopefully that helps get us started. Um, 